That was wonderful. I, um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Reverend Alice Reed, and um, I am the senior minister here, and I will confess to you once again that I love Christmas. I actually um, renew serious music in my car so I can listen to the Christmas music whenever I turn it on. <laughs> um, I do enjoy this time of year. Um, it is an uh, opportunity for me when we come together, when there's, um, you know, I'm an extrovert. I don't know, you know, one of the things about extroverts is that we draw energy from the environment around us. And so being at the high level of extrovertism, <laughs> <laughs> when you think about, like, uh, even even the people who aren't um, in a, a family tradition or a religion that celebrates Christmas are putting up Christmas trees and <laughs> exchanging gifts. We have a, a huge amount of energy in the world right now that is focused on this one thing from time to time. Maybe not as obsessively as me, but, <laughs> but definitely it's on our minds. And so I think that... I catch that, you know, I catch that energy. And so I really love to, um, it's really fun to be up here to talk about the different holidays. And uh, we've talked about uh, Hanukkah, and uh, we've talked about Bodhi Day. We're doing this metaphysical advent, and so I'm going to go over here and light these candles. I'm not going to light the menorah because uh, Hanukkah ended. But I am going to light these candles. This first candle represents hope. And this second candle, we talked about peace last week. And the pink candle is traditionally in, uh, lit this week, in this third week of Advent. And it represents joy. It represents that deep uh, bliss and uh, celebrate, celebratory kind of energy, and it is the anticipation of the Advent. And I wanted to read something to you that I came across this morning that, um, oh, I'm glad it came right up. <laughs> uh, uh, one of my favorite metaphysical Franciscan priests is Richard Rohr. And I mention him a lot on Sundays. And that's only because he's so brilliant and he really resonates with the principles that we teach. And uh, this morning, as he was writing about the um, Advent, he has this reading where he talks about celebrating incarnation. And I want to, and the, the, the reason that Advent can be so advantageous to us as we get into the season of the, and the, the energy of the holiday. And so he writes, we do have to make room for such a mystery because right now there is no room in the inn. We see things pretty much in their materiality, but we don't see the light shining through. We don't see the incarnate spirit that is hidden inside of everything in the material world. And so he's explaining why Advent is an opportunity for us to raise our awareness, to really go a little deeper, to look for that light within ourselves, and to really celebrate the joy of incarnation. He goes on to talk about early Eastern Christian culture that is not very well known in our westernized Christian circles. And he states, that um, the Eastern Church made it very clear that the incarnation of Christ manifests a universal principle. Incarnation meant not just that God became Jesus, but that God said yes to the material universe and the physicality itself. Does it sound a little familiar to, to what we talk about and teach in these principles? It, so, so today I want to look at the, this um, idea of wholeness, right? We've been taught this is the whole, all month we're looking at embodying wholeness and, re, uh, and having that living as wholeness and today is in the name of wholeness. And I want us to continue to look at this Christmas story 
in a way that might serve us. And so over the next two Sundays, we're, we're, today I'm going to talk about it. Next week we're going to do a today, and so you'll have a little experience of it. And so we'll have an opportunity to look at this Christmas story in a more metaphysical approach, something that is uh, more uh, meaningful to us. But I feel like we have to sort of unbundle some of the cultural norms, if you will, around the Christmas story, right? Because we... There's this, um, yeah, I'm going to say it. When, uh, when Christianity was being invented, it was not invented by Jesus. It was invented by Paul. <laughs> and there's a, there's a fatal flaw in the way that it was brought forward to humanity. And that fatal flaw was that Paul, who was so enamored 70 years after the death of Christ, Paul has this beautiful spiritual awakening, and he wants that awakening for his Roman brothers and sisters. He, you know, the Romans at that time had this nasty habit of going around and seizing land and, you know, enslaving people, and he wanted more civility for them. So he was well-intentioned. But what, what, when Paul began to preach the gospel, if you will, when he began to really talk about these principles that Jesus of Nazareth is credited with, he embedded this idea in the core of it that there was some power outside of us that was controlling our fate. And I consider that to be the fatal flaw, fatal flaw of Christianity, that in there's this idea that we are powerless, that we are at the mercy of some uh, puppet master, if you will, that has, you know, and if we're really good, if we behave, if we are controlled at some level, then we'll be um, rewarded. We'll re be rewarded in heaven after this lifetime. And so picture, if you will, you know, a couple of hundred years after, uh, you know, the year 400 A.D., and we have this society that is, you know, we have a lot of creature comforts these days, don't we? But back then, you know, just making it through the week, making it through the day even, was a chore and a challenge. You had to, you know, find water and food, and you had to make everything from scratch. It was nothing, no drive-through culture like we have now. And so the idea that um, there was a power outside of ourselves, humanity's self, that would um, reward us, it had to be couched in something that happened after this life experience because there was no way that people were going to experience that, those creature comforts in a society that was um, so challenging. And so it made sense that that is the way the whole Christian idea was born um, and, the, and the idea of Christianity. And we lost some real essential truths in the beautiful allegories and stories that were shared by Jesus of Nazareth that were steeped in peace and love and compassion and joy. There's a um, reason that Jesus had to use stories, that they, and even in the Gospels they had to use metaphor, they had to use symbology, because these ideas of a power that is central to each human being that lives within each one of us was, seemed very far-fetched for the culture and the society at that time. And so they built the ideas about the power that lives within us that, you know, that famous, a uh, couple of famous quotes that come out of the Bible are, you know, the Father and I are one, the kingdom of heaven is within. Like those ideas might, might have been a little too difficult to swallow in a time that was much more primitive than the time we live in today. And so we have these metaphors and these stories and these allegories, and one of them is the Christmas story. 
Um, I learned recently that the traditions of Christmas were originally introduced to Christianity through St. Francis of Assisi. And that was 1,200 years after the, the uh, death of Christ. And so we, we you know, up in, for those first 1,200 years, the big holiday was Easter. It was all about the, you know, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And yet uh, St. Francis, in his innocence, those of you who are familiar with St. Francis, he was a, a saint and a Franciscan and uh, was absolutely just um, wild about God and wild about nature. And he, he's actually the patron saint of animals. And he really saw the, the beauty in all life. And he was the one who began to really say, let's celebrate the joy of the incarnation of God in humanity, of God in humanity. And that is core to what we teach, that there isn't some exception out there that we go to. There isn't some intermediary that we have to go to to have our experience of the oneness with all life and the, and the relationship with the spirit and, um, as I like to say, the thing that makes the grass grow that is so interconnected with all life. Well, St. Francis is the perfect person to bring that forward, that idea that we should be celebrating this idea that we're all incarnated over and over again, that God is creating out of itself into the world as you and as me and as every human being and every animal, every rock, every tree. He, he loved nature so much. He's the one who appropriated the pagan, some of the pagan rituals and brought them into the Christian uh, practices of, that we know now of having a tree in our home. You know, back they would have candles on the trees, the wreaths and um, mistletoe and the uh, Yule log. There's some, you know, Google it. There's some really cool things. Would you, you would want to Google uh, pagan practices appropriated by Christians. <laughs> You'll get a really great uh, example of many of these things, too many that, that I don't really have time to, to go into this morning. But the idea is that um, Christianity wanted to bring these practices and rituals that were so uh, familiar to the common people that we have the Santa Claus and Christmas and Christmas wreaths. And so as we, as we walk through this holiday season in this day and age, right? I don't know about you, but I was brought up with, I had a Catholic grandma. It was my namesake, actually. She was Alice Frazier. And, um, and I was named after her. I was, her <coughs> I was one of her first grandchildren, first female grandchildren. Child. That's why I got Alice. And um, she was devout. And she instilled in me this idea of reward. Because that's pretty, this idea of if I behave, I will be rewarded. And, and I, you know, it, it made sense to me. It was a system. All I had to do was play by the system. And I would get presents. And I would, you know, Christmas would come along. And she, she, she shared with me her ideas about, <coughs> excuse me, she shared with me these ideas that we subscribe to today. Um, whether we believe them or not, there's some part of us that believes them, that practices them. But this idea of a um, great exception, that Jesus as the only son of God. But as I became more... Um, mature and uh, and with my curiosity I got a little I got a li it started to feel a little confusing to me how what 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 about God's daughter I mean you know here I am a woman a young girl I, certainly God has daughters too not just sons you know it didn't make sense to me <coughs> excuse me <laughs> I'm I'm looking at the sound guy saying help me with that um, <laughs> sorry Yes, certainly God has daughters and sons 
and all of creation is an expression of that spirit nature that wants to create out of itself. And I found the, um, the idea that we would have this amazing teacher that was bringing so much light and truth to the planet, and then we'd kill him. Like, that didn't make sense either. And so I had to do my own exploring with a lot of these ideas. I had to begin to try to understand and make sense of them because some part of me knew there was truth in it. Some part of me knew that there was not the external surface truth of the stories that we've been told, but that this idea that there was this great principle of life that came to the planet to illuminate us, to liberate us from enslavement of uh, believing that we weren't worthy and to liberate us into worthiness, into wholeness, into our perfection. And that's what I see. I see the, the Christ story as, the, as a demarker, if you will, in humanity's evolution where we can begin to let go of the the downtrodden idea of being, you know, in this world and being put upon, and we can begin to find that light within ourselves that is going to shine through everything that we experience when we acknowledge it. There's a wonderful um, series of books, actually, by Houston Smith, and um, he wrote a book about world religions and he writes this, Jesus located the authority for his teachings not in himself or in God as removed, but in his hearers' hearts, in his hearers' hearts. My teachings are true, he said in effect, because against all conventionality, our own hearts attest to this truth. So th when you hear something, when you hear a truth principle, when you hear something that is, is, it might be new and different, you've never heard it before, it happens a lot in rooms like this, and yet there's some part of you that resonates with it, that is the same way that Jesus brought this evolutionary idea to humanity. Whether it is myth or truth, it, it was an opportunity for us to open up to a greater good. Houston goes on to say that something in us recognized truth when we hear it, that a primary aspect of Jesus' teaching was to heal all divides, including lines that divide people. There was an important feature of the holiness program of his day that Jesus found unacceptable. The holiness program of his day was temples that were only there for the healthy and the rich that you had to buy your way into a temple, and if you had any illness whatsoever, you were not allowed in. And so Jesus found this completely unacceptable, the, that these were more lines that were drawn between people and divided them, noting the separation that existed in his time where people who were clean and unclean, pure and defiled, sacred and profane, Jew and Gentile, righteous and sinner, having included that Yahweh's central attribute was compassion. Jesus saw social barriers as an affront to that compassion. So he parlayed with tax collectors, dined with the outcasts and sinners, socialized with prostitutes, and healed on the Sabbath when compassion prompted doing so. This made him a social prophet, challenging the boundaries of the existing order and advocating an alternate vision of human community. So I'm going to read that last sentence again. This made him a social prophet, challenging the boundaries of the existing order and advocating an alternative vision of the human community. Again, sounds familiar. I really think when I look at the teaching and the, the power of the, the true message of the Christ principle, that what is there for us to glean is that despite what we see around us, despite the 
the, the ideas of separation and division and divisiveness, then we have an opportunity to practice a Christ principle of oneness, a Christ principle of compassion, a Christ principle of seeing ourselves as one human family. I think Jesus was the first religious scientist, honestly. <laughs> I really do. And I think that the example that we have of the healings that Jesus of Nazareth did were the, were the perfect example of what you can experience with a practitioner when you work with them and they know your wholeness despite any circumstance that might be, you might be experiencing. And they know your, uh, your healing, they know the things that uh, your own heart knows is possible for your own life. And so when we work with practitioners, and I have to tell you, there was a time, and I've said this before, I'm sorry if I repeat myself, but there was a time if I walked in a room and you said the J word, I was out the door. I was just not having any of it because I felt wounded in, uh, by our American Christianity. And I remember being in ministerial training and they assigned, the, we were all looking at prophets and religious um, heroes and guess who they assigned for me? <laughs> <laughs> right, I had to study Jesus, yeah. And I remember that that beautiful awareness of all the works that are ascri ascribed to Jesus are the same works that we do as practitioners. I remember that, like, oh, wow, I get it now. I get it now. Yeah. It's a beautiful path to choose to love, to see beauty, to find joy, to know wholeness, and to choose to see that despite conditions. Emma Curtis Hopkins writes about one of the gospel stories where the apostles were studying with Jesus of Nazareth and they were really frustrated. And so they said, teach us how to pray. And he taught them what is commonly known today as the Lord's Prayer. And if you've read Emmett Fox, he metaphysizes that prayer. And, and I believe he got that from Emma Curtis Hopkins. And then my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Kathy Ann Lewis, she further metaphysized that Lord's Prayer. And I think that it becomes more of an affirmation than a begging. That idea that we instead of coming to some power outside of ourselves, we begin to understand that that power is everywhere. It's within us, it's around us, it's outside of us, it's, it's in the, our very DNA. And so as we move through this holiday season, as we look at this Christmas story of the incarnation of God itself, we are talking about the creative process. We're talking about the creation of love over and over again as humanity, as the experiences we have. And we have the opportunity to dig deep and to see past the illusions that we have created thanks to our culture and our society and to really begin to see life at its deepest and most powerful and profound level. My hope is that as you look at this Christmas story, and we're going to do some stuff next week, but as you, as you look at this Christmas story, you'll find some meaning for you. You'll find something that you can walk away with that can enrich your relationship with life. And um, we're going to support you in that. And the way we're going to support you in that is this Wednesday, I'm going to be doing a solstice meditation. And so if you're available at 6.30 and you want to drop by, we're going to look at the winter solstice and we'll relate it to that awakening and the light within that becomes more prevalent as we awaken. We'll do a little practice. And then next Sunday, we'll, um, 
for Christmas Eve morning. We'll jo you'll join us and we'll do a candle lighting and we'll talk more about the metaphysical story of Christmas with some beautiful music and meditation. And so are I hope that you'll join us as we move through the last 10, is it eight days? Yeah, last eight days of, of the, ho the Christmas holiday season. And I encourage you and invite you to open your heart, to be curious, to look for the meaning for you that will be the light that reflects the light within you so that you can see it all around you. I'm going to um, end our time together with uh, my own take on the Lord's Prayer, and I'll follow that with a spiritual mind treatment. So if I could invite our piano player to come forward. And I want to thank you for indulging me in my love for the holidays as we look at the metaphysical meaning behind it all. Okay. So this is a metaphysical Lord's Prayer. And remember, Lord equals law. And you can substitute that for yourself in your own language. Mother, Father, God within, wholeness is our name. Our kingdom is here and now. Love's will is done within us. Give us this day everything we claim and need. Forgive any lack of confidence we have to command the law. Let us move our minds so that we are not tempted by appearances. Let us know truth that is beyond any idea of evil. For ours is the realm of power and glory and love within forever and ever. Amen. And so know with me that the power and the presence of the glory of love and power and peace and hope and joy live within us fully, that there is a power and a presence of, of all of these things always available to each one of us. And so we drop into that inner sanctum of light and love, and we allow ourselves to move forward to be that amazing compassion that is so mythologized through the story of the incarnation of God come again as man, as woman, as child, as beast, as tree, as rock. And so as we open our minds and we open our hearts, we allow ourselves to be one with all of this, to find the meaning, the thing that pulls us forward through our passion and through our heartfelt peace in knowing our wholeness here and now. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for the mythos of the holiday season. I am grateful for the community where we have an opportunity to explore it. And I am grateful for the world that continues to challenge me to look within, to let go of an old paradigm of power outside of me and to know that the power that I express is a power that is fueled by peace and compassion and love. So I simply anchor this prayer knowing that God is one, expressed as many. So we feel the glory in all of that and we simply anchor this by saying, and so it is. Thank you very much.